Chapter 81 Change of Plans You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3 to 8.50 a.m. Bacoer City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoer City, Cavita After confirming the ability of the mutated biter to scream and thought of the plan to lure the infected away from the police command center, he was getting ready to go back inside and prepare. However, there was another movement that caught his eye. It looked like the scream not only attracted the infected. Looking at the windows of second floor of the city health center, Mark saw the white-coated silhouettes behind the windows. Mark closed his eyes and concentrated on expanding the area of his empathic ability. He could not turn the ability on and off and the area was several meters wide but his distance away from the city health center was larger than his detection area. As his detection area finally reached the building, he felt the fear coming from the silhouettes on the second floor. Mark confirmed it, those were living people. There were survivors trapped in the health center. Mark was about to release his ability and return it back to normal. Using this wide range for a long time was taking a huge toll on his energy. However, he froze. He could not control the shape of his detection area so he could only expand it. As he expanded it to reach the health center, the police command center was also reached by his detection. Mark looked at the command center. There were also people inside. However, many of the people had a lingering killing intent and were giving him danger signals. These people could not be member of the police. Now that he thought of it, it was a police station. Looking at the infected below, he could see some of them wearing police uniforms. However, he never saw anyone wearing orange or yellow uniforms. A police station would never lack of those people. Mark was thinking about the convicted criminals. He never saw even one below. It meant that the people inside the command center at was giving him the threatening feeling were those prisoners. Another change of plan. How troublesome. Whether he liked it or not, it looked like that he needed to agree with bringing some people with him. Mark counted the people he detected. There were 8 inside the health center and 20.3 inside the police station. If not for the equipment inside the police station, he might not want to deal with this troublesome situation. However, he was really lacking of those. The police station should have Kevlar vests, riot shields and riot helmets. He wanted those more than the weapons. Still, was he afraid of those people? No. With his ability, he could create an ambush without them knowing. He only needed to bring people not to fight but to create a scene to at least intimidate the criminals. What was the bane of criminals? Of course, it was the police. Just seeing people in police uniforms was enough to make criminals feel some kind of repulsion and become intimidated, even if the person in front of them was not really a part of the police at all. Gail, let's go. Mark called unto the little girl who was sitting by the edge of the rooftop while watching the party of the infected below. She stood up and made a last look at the fruit above them before skipping towards her papa. The father and daughter duo went back towards the reception area of the fourth floor of the city hall. As they entered, Mark saw Charmaine happily chatting with the nurse. It looked like she regained some of her energy back. She should be able to move now. Big brother. How is it? Charmaine called out after she saw Mark and Abigail. The area outside is still dangerous but we could leave any time if you're ready. Hearing his answer, Charmaine felt both happy and sad. She felt happy because she could leave this place and sad because she could not do anything to help the people here. Um. You will really leave us here. The nurse sitting beside Charmaine hesitated at first but still asked Mark. In the past two days, this nurse and Charmaine spent time together as they were around the same age and the nurse were taking care of Charmaine's condition. Though she was happy that Charmaine's brother was here to pick up her new friend but she also wished that they would be saved. Tell me. What do I get if I saved you all? Mark coldly replied with another question which made the nurse look down. He was right. There was really nothing in for him if he were to save them. Not only that. They would also be a burden to them. Big bro. Can we at least bring her with us? 
Charmaine pleaded. We're going to look for big sis and other people right. Then what if they are injured? We need someone who can treat them. Her rationale was on point. Even if they could also give treatment to injuries, the treatment from someone with experience was different. Mark nodded at Charmaine's proposition as she had a point. However, if you really want to bring her, we can but the question here is. Wasn't she needed there? Mark pointed at the room just behind him with his right thumb. Inside that room, there were several injured people. Mark noticed it when he arrived and also thought that it was the reason why Mark did not see the nurse before when he was controlling the drone from outside the window. The nurse was touched by Charmaine's suggestion but hesitated as Mark said his piece. She really did not know what to do now. On contrary, Mark nodded at the nurse's hesitation. If she readily agreed to abandon the injured people he just pointed out, then, she was not worth his time at all. All right, you can come with us. Mark said making the nurse dumbfounded. Charmaine felt really happy. But, what will happen to them? Don't worry about it. I'll just get some people to replace you in that case. Both Charmaine and the nurse were confused with what Mark said. He wanted to get some people to replace her. Where was he going to get them? They wanted to ask but their conversation was cut short. It looked like the congresswoman was informed about Mark's return and went out to meet him. As Madame Laney approached, she smiled. You're back. Are you going inside the PCC now? I know you said that you don't need any help but I think, you should really allow my men to go with you. Mark directly looked at her and answered. Actually, my plans have changed. I want some of the policemen you have to accompany me. When the congresswoman heard his reply, she felt happy. At least, there was a room for cooperation. The chance of making him help them would become higher. However, she felt that there was something wrong for this person to suddenly change his mind. Did something happen? She asked with a concerned tone and Mark nodded to her question. It looks like the inmates in your police station escaped. Those guys are now occupying the upper floors of the station. There are 23 of them. Chief Mallory who was behind the congresswoman sucked a mouthful of air. Those damn bastards escaped. How? He voiced his concern. Well, I don't know about that. Don't ask me. Mark answered the chief and turned back to Madame Laney. Also, I found survivors inside the second floor of the health center. There are eight of them. They should be doctors, nurses and patients if I'm right. The congresswoman was surprised. Not because Mark found people on other buildings but because this man actually gave them precise numbers. Are you sure? Also how did you know those numbers? Are they accurate? Don't doubt me about this. The figures I gave are accurate. Just don't ask me how I knew. Mark glared at the congresswoman. The glare did not hold any ill intent but just gave his message to her. It was that he knew what he was doing. Madam Laney looked at him and nodded. How many people do you need? Just three or four is enough. I don't need them to act. I just need them to create some intimidation. What do you mean? To the congresswoman's question, it was Chief Mallory who answered her. Madam, he should be thinking of using us to create a psychological deterrence. If those criminals saw that there are policemen approaching, even if they are not scared, they should still panic inside affecting their movements and thinking. The congresswoman was enlightened to his explanation. It looks like you know your stuff. Mark said. Please, don't underestimate me. I didn't get to this position for nothing. We also use this tactic in some of our operations. What about the survivors in the health center? Madame Laney asked Mark. She was hoping that they could help those people but the key to this should be Mark. She did not know why but her intuition that she relied on for years was telling her that this person was not someone simple. Actually, I want to get medicine for my sister. If they could bring medicine for me, then I will give some effort to save them. Is that true? 
Madame Laney's face lightened. They were really in need of medical personnel at this moment. The only person they have here was the only nurse that managed to come with them during their escape to this floor and no one else. Ednell.co, well, that will come for later. We need to get the weapons in the police station first. Don't expect that I will save those people alone. Your men needed to help too and they will need weapons. Then, are we going to build a plan to deal with the people inside the PCC? There's no need. As I said earlier, I only need them to act. As for the fighting, leave that to me. I need more practice with this you see. Mark pointed at his assault rifle. He did not even hide his bloodlust. While most people would not feel it, the veteran bodyguards and the policemen shivered. This man was itching to kill people. After this, you will leave with your sister right? Madame Laney suddenly asked. Yes. Is there any way for you to agree in escorting us? After retrieving the weapons, we won't be a baggage for your group right? This nurse here just asked me the same question before you came you know that. Furthermore, where are you people even going? I don't think you guys will be able to go to any evacuation center. The nearest one should be in the Bay City. No, we won't be going to Bay City. We have been communicating through the radio with another police branch. They managed to secure a private subdivision along with quite a number of survivors. That place should be nearer and better than this crumbling building. Hearing that, Mark became interested. The local police actually managed to secure a place. He was surprised. It was not that he was ridiculing his country's police forces but with what he saw and experienced in the past days, something like that would not be easy. Unless. Mark looked at Abigail. Say, did that police branch had someone who got bitten but did not turn. And even got a superhuman ability. Chief Mallory and Madame Laney were shocked. How did you know? As Mark saw their shocked faces, it dawned to him. These people did not know about mutators and anything about mutagen. That was right. These people lost contact with the military. Still, Mark had no notion to tell these guys about it. It was too troublesome to explain. Don't ask me how. Where is this place you are talking about? Madame Laney had her suspicions but did not press the issue. She answered. Forenza. Hearing the name of the subdivision, Mark choked. Even Charmaine who was sitting down almost stood up in shock. Mark's next destination after getting out of this place was Charmaine's house. The reason to that was to pick up her younger sister. And Forenza, it was another private subdivision in front of the private subdivision where Charmaine's house was located. Chapter 82 Charging Towards the Police Command Center You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Day 3 to 9 10 a.m., Bacoor City Hall, 4th floor, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoor City, Kavita. The Congresswoman did not see any change in Mark's expression, but she noticed the shock in Charmaine's face after she said the name of the subdivision. Is something wrong? To her question, Mark decided to be frank. He also knew that Charmaine's expression gave it away. That place is just in front of the subdivision where her house is. Is that so? Wait, you two are siblings right? The congresswoman asked which made Mark annoyed. Why are you asking about something private? I apologize. I just grew curious. Though, I think I get the picture here. Madame Laney looked at Mark and Charmaine alternately. As Mark felt what she was thinking about, he said. You are thinking about it too much. Yes, we are not biological siblings. So what? You should stop thinking about unnecessary things. Seriously. Women. Mark wanted to add but just voiced it in his mind. What do you think? Will you escort us there? If there are people you need to find there, I can tell my men to find them. Are you saying that you will just let the people under your jurisdiction suffer just because I declined? No. I did not say that. At least, if you agreed to help us, I can make taking care of those people a priority. 
Going back to the whole conversation, Mark could only think of one thing. Politicians were really cunning. However, he could not immediately decline this one. He looked at Charmaine and at her pleading look. He sighed. All right. If you people can find your own vehicles. Then, I can at least help you people out of this building. The eyes of everyone who heard him lightened. Mark swatted their expectations though as he said his piece to the congresswoman. Don't get your hopes up too much. I want you to help us find someone first and we'll talk later. We still have something else to do. And with that, Mark told Madame Laney about Charmaine's younger sister and her description before going towards the discussion about how to deal with the people in the police command center and the city health center. Day 3 to 9.30 a.m., Bacoor City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoor City, Cavita, Mayor, do it. Mark said as he stared at the drone flying above the rooftop of the city health center. On the rooftop of the health center, there were several people wearing dirty lab coats and uniforms. After the discussion with the congresswoman, Mark spent another 15 minutes to prepare and went back to the rooftop to commence the plan. Now however, it was not just him and Abigail who was on the rooftop. Behind him, there were three policemen. One of the policemen was actually Chief Mallory who volunteered to participate. The chief participating was actually on the favor to the plan. Out of all the members of the police, it was him who could create the most effect against the minds of the criminals. Using the drone, Mark told the people to go to the rooftop of the health center and use the same way he did to give the radio to Charmaine. One of the doctors just took the radio taped under the drone and let the drone fly away after Mark's signal. Hello. I'm Dr. Galvez. Is what you said before true? We will get rescued from here. The doctor said towards the radio. Mark did not reply and handed his radio to the police chief to do the talking. Dr. Galvez, this is Police Chief Mallory. What this person said earlier is true. You people there just needed to wait a bit more since we needed to retrieve the weapons in the station first. What the police chief said was heard by all the people behind Dr. Galvez. The nurses hugged each other with the others were jumping in joy. Finally, they would get away from this place. Thank you, Chief Mallory. Dr. Galvez voiced his gratitude. Don't thank me doctor. If not for this man beside me, it was all impossible to do. And this is a trade. You people are in the health center and you had all the medicine there. We can only proceed on helping you after you packed the medicine he needed. Hearing that, Dr. Galvez nodded. He already knew this fact. The drone, the radio, and that man that contacted them first did not belong to the government. That person would only help them with the proper payment. Chief, we'll gather everything we can get. What medicine does he want? Insulin, for those with type 2 diabetes. Do you have them in stock? There should be five bottles remaining. All right. I'll cut this conversation short. We have other urgent things to do. Then chief, we'll wait. The silhouettes of people at the city hall rooftop retreated as Dr. Galvez put down the radio in his hand. He then shouted at the people behind him. Everyone, you heard it. Gather up everything. Food, medicine and other necessary equipment we can carry. Pack up some injections and the insulin bottles in another container. We'll wait until they contact us again. They are our only ticket out of here. Everyone nodded and they all rushed back into the building. Back in the rooftop, Mark received the radio the chief returned to him. Now, it was time to deal with the people at the command center. Mark and the policemen deduced some of the possibilities they might encounter. First, if the criminals were armed. If that was the case, then it was likely that these people already ransacked the armory inside out. Then there was no reason to go to the first floor anymore and the weapons and equipment might have been already stored in the higher floors. Second, it was the possibility of the criminals escaping. There were four ways for them to escape. 
two of which could lead to the criminals infiltrating the city hall out of desperation while one would lead them escaping to the farmlands behind the compound and the last one was more inclined to the policeman's favor and it was if the criminals try to escape out to the front of the police station. The last one would surely lead to the criminals being killed by the infected. Due to the two escape routes, there were actually six policemen participating in this plan. Three was with Mark who would infiltrate the command center and three who would guard the suspended pathway to the fourth floor of the city hall. They only need to shoot the criminals that would pass on the pathway and there was no escape for them. As the start of the plan, Mark picked up a golf ball-sized debris from the rooftop. Ba-dump. Ba-dump. Mark's eyes squinted as he activated his adrenaline rush and concentrated it on his right arm. Along with his slightly strengthened body, he threw the debris towards the window of the command center's top floor. Swoosh. Crash. The pieces of windows scattered into the room and onto the pavement below. The stone Mark threw was to create an impact to the minds of the scouts watching them. This was not a stealth mission. The criminals had long seen their group and Mark was sure that these guys also saw him before. Earlier when he detected these criminals, there was only one person guarding the top floor but now, there were several of them. Mark was sure that these guys were alerted to his existence. If that was the case, then, just burst into the front line and straightly deal with these people. After shattering the windows, Mark turned to the chief. It was his turn. All of you convicts inside the station. Surrender yourselves to the police. The chief shouted towards the building. Mark scanned the building and felt the people inside the command center being intimidated after Chief Mallory shouted. However, there were a few people who did not seem to be affected. Mark could hear a faint shouting inside the building and the intimidation was alleviated to those people that were affected. It seemed that there was someone who was leading the bunch of society scums. Mark turned to Gail. Gail, how about having a contest with Papa? Abigail looked at him confused. The three policemen beside them also felt the same and perked their ears at the conversation of the father and daughter. Papa, what contest? Abigail tilted her head cutely. Let's see who will defeat more of those bad guys there. The policemen were floored after hearing that. Mark, what are saying to your daughter? The chief could not help but ask. However, the two in question just glanced at him and ignored his question. Then Papa, if I win, I want a present. What present do you want, I will tell Papa later. All right. Then if I win. The little girl was seriously thinking. Mark ruffled her hair and smiled. Just give Papa a hug if I win then. Gail nodded while smiling. The policeman did not know what to say about the conversation of the two. Of course the father would win. What could a little girl do in this situation anyway? Mark looked at the command center then at Chief Mallory. There are movements inside. We're starting. You guys just need to provide cover. After saying that, Mark had drawn his pistol and jumped onto the roof of the suspended pathway with Abigail following behind him. He reached into his collar and played the music on his phone. Another battle song was played. Mark's heartbeat pumped faster as his adrenaline level rose higher. His eyes turned sharper and concentration had risen by several levels. The chief was shocked as Abigail followed her father and tried to grab her. It was a dangerous situation after all and not a place for a little girl to participate into. However, with Abigail's speed, would he be able to catch the little girl? Of course not. Chief. What are we going to do? One of the policemen asked. Damn it. Stick to the plan. Provide cover. The policemen took out their pistols and aimed at the windows of the command center. If there were anyone who would try to peek out of the window, they would shoot. However, when the three looked at the Mark and Abigail, they became slack-jawed. Fast. The two was already just a few steps away from the building. Tist. Tist. 
Mark made two shots with his silenced pistol and two criminals who had guns that tried to peek out of the window were silenced forever. It seemed that not only the police failed to react to the father and daughter's movements. Even the scouts at the front rooms of the command center were dumbfounded. Mark squinted as he felt movements on rooftop of the command center. It seemed that there were still others who could keep up with the situation. Several people went up to the rooftop. Some of them were even holding riot shields and wearing police helmets. Abigail saw them. With a single kick on the roof of the pathway, the little girl turned into a red blur and jumped onto the rooftop before charging towards the bad men that just came out. Abigail kicked the surface the riot shield one of the criminals were holding blasting him away to the wall and directly fell unconscious. Bang! Bang! The shootout between the two groups started. The scouts finally reacted and tried to shoot Mark who was still running on the roof of the pathway but they were pushed back into hiding as the police started shooting them. Several of the scouts were even killed but not by the shots the policemen made but by Mark who was closer. Chief! What in the world are they? The policemen were both amazed and dumbfounded. While they were providing cover, they saw everything. The little girl who they thought was just a distraction and needed to be protected actually jumped several meters away onto the rooftop of the command center and kicked one of the criminals unconscious. Furthermore, the criminal was actually a burly middle-aged man who was even equipped with a riot shield and a helmet. Mark on the other hand might not look too eye-catching but as the police who were experienced in this field, how could they not notice that Mark was already aiming at the criminal's direction before they could even poke their head out? Although not all his shots were accurate, half of the shots he made killed a single person per bullet. Seeing the performance of the two, the chief remembered their contact with the police branch that secured Forenza. It dawned into him. This father and daughter might be the same as that person there. People who gained superhuman abilities. Chapter 83 Wiping Out the Escaped Criminals You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3 to 9.35 a.m., Bacoer City Police Command Center Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanan, Bacoer City, Cavita Bang. 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 A group of seven inmates were scrambling around. Five of them were firing pistols while two held a riot shield and a police baton. The men with guns were firing indiscriminately in panic. In their front, a red blur could be seen agilely dodging a gunshots. Click. Click. One of them had the clip of his pistol empty as he heard the clicking sound twice while trying to fire his gun. That moment, the red blur charged straight at him. As the blur was charging straight, he could see the figure more clearer. It was a little girl. His eyes dilated. What kind of monster was this? This was no little girl at all. After that split second that he realized what they were fighting with, inmate's eyes went black. He received a kick on his forehead without being able to react and his neck bent backwards. One of them died just like that. The remaining criminals became frenzied. What was happening? They had no idea at all. When the kick connected, there was a split second that they saw a little girl with a red frilled dress with her foot planted at the forehead of their comrade. The next thing they knew was that the neck of their comrade was bent at an unnatural angle before his body flew to the wall behind them. Bang! Bang! The little girl turned into a blur once more and retreated. Tist! One of the men who were shooting at the little girl fell down. There was a hole on his temple and was bleeding profusely. On the roof of the suspended pathway Mark immediately jumped back after shooting one of the inmates that was shooting his daughter. Pang! A shot bore a hole at the place he was standing before he jumped. Tist! The person who shot him just now fell with a hole on his forehead. Mark was pissed. Those bunch of fools were actually ganging up on Abigail. He holstered his pistol and pulled up the assault rifle on his side. He was using the pistol as the M16 was a gun not suitable for sprinting, harder to aim and not suitable for narrow spaces. However, he stopped caring anymore. 
TSTSTSTSTSTSTSTST. He switched the M16 into full auto and rained half a clip of ammo at the group Abigail was fighting with. The men with guns immediately fell and one with the shield soon followed. One guy managed to react in time and blocked the barrage of bullets with the riot shield. However, was he safe? No. With a crack, his neck bent as a foot of a little girl made contact with the right side of his face. Abigail landed on the rooftop after giving that vicious kick. She looked at the dead men then looked at her papa. She was displeased and shouted. Papa. These bad guys are mine. TSST. Mark shot another inmate that tried to shoot him from the window. He looked at Abigail and said. You took too long killing them. Mew. Papa bad. Pft, all right. Add those guys to your score. Hearing that, the little girl calmed down. It looked like she wanted the present more than actually doing the killing. Even if she was like this, she was still a little girl. Children always love to receive presents from their parents. On the rooftop of the city hall, the chief and his two subordinates did not know what to say after hearing the conversation of the father and daughter. The two were more savage than those criminals. However, they also received a lingering fear from the two. They were not human at all. It was better for them to not offend these monsters or they would not even know how they died. We need to report this to Madam later. Chief Mallory said making his subordinates nod helplessly. The sounds of guns firing stopped. It was not because the criminals were already wiped out but because the remaining inmates retreated inside. By the looks of it, the one who was leading the criminals deemed the situation dangerous and started to focus on defense. The scouts were wiped out. The group on the rooftop was the same. Mark jumped onto the rooftop and joined Abigail who was looking down while spreading her fingers one by one. Mark almost laughed. The little girl was having a hard time counting her score. Mark looked down by his feet. He spread his detection area below and felt the remaining criminals gathering and preparing an ambush in several rooms. Counting how many was killed, the scouts were nine people while there were eight here. The total they killed was seventeen. There were still six inside along with the leader-like figure of the criminals. Killing them was very easy to mark since there was cover fire from behind provided by the three policemen. If not, it would be a lot harder and more dangerous. The scouts did not dare to poke their heads at the same time which gave him the leeway to pick on the limited number of heads poking out. Still, it was really unfair to these criminals. While they needed to aim at their target outside, the person outside was already anticipating their movements. It was like playing a shooting arcade to mark where enemies who had shots that would hit him would be showing a red marker. To him however, there was a sudden surge of emotional fluctuations to those people who was planning to shoot making it easier for him to detect where the shot would come from. It was real life hacking. A real life wall hack. Mark looked at Abigail who finished counting her score. While he had a wall hack, this girl injected a speed hack into the game called Real Life. Dodging five people shooting pistols at her and she was left unscathed. That feat could not be replicated by anyone. Ha! Huh. Mark was confused and suddenly looked at a far direction. He detected two more people in the furthest room of the command center. Their emotional fluctuation was very weak. It should be the reason why he did not detect them earlier. However, Mark also felt pity on the two he just detected. The emotion that was enveloping the two was despair. Considering the possibilities, those two should be women. And they were here stuck with a group of animals in human skin. It was very easy to tell what happened to the two. As the gunfight died down, the three policemen caught up to the father and daughter standing on the rooftop. Chief Mallory and Abigail noticed that there was something wrong as Mark was blankly looking at a certain direction. Papa, what are you looking at? Nothing. Mark shook his head. As if he would narrate what he just deduced to a little girl. Chief Mallory approached the two. Mark, there should be some of those scums remaining inside right. 
what are your plans? To the chief's view, blindly charging inside was a bad idea. There were too many rooms inside the command center. They would not know where these criminals would be hiding. Of course, he would never think that Mark already determined the locations of those guys. Mark heard his question but he did not reply and looked at the chief in confusion. I'm surprised. You're not going to ask anything about us. The chief smiled bitterly. I won't bother. I don't think that you will answer anyway. Mark laughed. At least this person knew what to ask and what was not. About your question. We'll just bust in. What? It will be dangerous without a concrete plan. Who knows where those bastards would be hiding? You don't have to worry about that. Just follow behind us. With that, Mark turned around and drew his pistol once more. The inside of the police station would be narrow and using an assault rifle in there was a foolish idea unless they arrive at the main hallways which would be unlikely. The criminals were hiding not far from them after all. He entered into then command center with Abigail and the three policemen behind him. They were greeted with a flight of stairs leading to the third floor of the command center. Reaching the third floor, Mark led the group towards the western side of the hallway. He then stopped in front of one of the doors. The chief knew that this was one of the offices his late subordinates used. He felt remorse as he knew that the subordinates he was mingling with in the past days was now gone. However, now was not the time to mourn about the dead. They were here to deal with the trash of the society. Tist. Mark shot the lock of the door and kicked the door open. Bang. Bang. Several gunshots echoed making the policemen step back and find cover. Mark also hid beside the wall but he was not as panicked as the policeman. Abigail was remaining calm as ever and charged inside without waiting for her papa's instruction. The next thing they heard was a scream and sounds of things breaking before Abigail walked out like it was nothing. Mark wanted to reprimand the little girl for charging in like that but decided to do it later. He turned around without checking the inside of the room and proceeded along the hallway. The three policemen could not help but become curious. Chief Mallory sent one of his subordinates to check what happened inside while he followed Mark with the other policemen. The subordinate he sent to check soon returned and relayed the information to him. What the policeman saw was an inmate with a broken neck lying on a broken wooden table. The chief shook his head. He knew that they were really not needed here. Since that was the case, he sent his two subordinates to go back and collect the guns and equipment that the dead inmates used. He was the only policeman that continued to follow Mark. Mark checked several rooms. It looked like he was just choosing random rooms but in every room he chose, there was someone hiding inside. It happened five times and only one person was left. Mark frowned though. The last person was running into the furthest room where the two women he detected were detained. Chief Mallory, the last one is going to get hostages. What do you want to do? The chief was shocked. Hostages. Can you save them? You know that I always ask for payment if it comes to saving lives right. Damn. Could you be even just a bit compassionate? The chief cursed in his heart. Can we talk about that later? It's not like we can escape from you right? All right. Mark rushed towards the end of the hallway and into the last room. The door was not locked and it looked like it was deliberately left open. Mark kicked the door open and the scene inside was revealed to them. Mark immediately pulled the little girl out of the view and prevented her from seeing the scene. Gail. Stay here all right. Don't peek inside. The bad guy there is mine. Seeing his serious eyes, the little girl nodded. This little girl was very sensible compared to other children of her age. She knew that what was inside was not for her to see. She went to the side of the hallway and sat on the corner. Mark and Chief Mallory entered the room. It was one of the resting rooms in the station. There were several bunker beds here. However, the nauseating smell of male's juice was suffocating. 
At the end of the room, there was a fat man holding two naked women at gunpoint. Welcome chief. The fat man smiled sarcastically and sinisterly at the chief before turning to Mark. And you. What are you? There's also that little monster. What are you bastards? You ruined all my plans. Damn you f asterisk curse. The fat man cursed while pointing his gun at Mark. However, the person in question did not even react and just stared at him. The fat man was dumbfounded as he saw Mark stare. Mark was looking at him like he was looking at a dead person. Shit. Why are you looking at me like that? You think you can shoot me without killing these two bitches? Just try. To his provocation, Mark did not answer but let out a sinister smile. He holstered his pistol under the shocked eyes of the fat man and the chief. What are you doing? The chief asked in panic. Mark did not answer me. Ha ha ha. You chose to surrender because of these whores. This will be your end. However, Mark's smile did not diminish. He raised his right open palm towards the fat man. Are you crazy? What do you think UF Asterisk Ucker is doing? But then, he choked. He lost grip of his gun and the gun fell to the ground. He even let go of the two women he was holding. His body shook, his eyes, ears and nose started to bleed. He felt pain in his head as if it was going to split apart. At the last moment, he tried to look at Mark. Mark was still pointing his open palm at the fat man while letting out a sinister smile. However, his eyes were now glowing red. With that last horrifying scene in his mind, the fat man fell unconscious. Chapter 84 Rescuing the Survivors in the City Health Center You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3 to 10.07 a.m., Backover City Hall, 4th Floor, Mayor's Office, Molino Boulevard, Bayanan, Backover City, Kavita Chief Mallory sat in front of the mayor's desk as he just finished reporting everything that happened at the command center. On the other end of the desk, the congresswoman of District 2 Bacor, Madame Laney Villa was massaging her temples with an exhausted look on her face. The report she just received was very hard to swallow. The escaped inmates were wiped out. That was a good thing as these people would only add fuel to the fire created by the apocalypse. The problem however was that the cause of it was just a pair of a father and a daughter. Furthermore, the daughter was just a five or six year old little girl. There were also the non-human abilities the two displayed during the confrontation with the inmates. Specifically, the abnormal speed the little girl had and that mysterious ability Mark used to deal with the most notorious man among the inmates. It was lucky that she did not push her chances too much in front of Mark. Garcia would be in trouble later. Madame Laney muttered and the police chief agreed to what she said. Garcia was the businessman who offended Mark. Thinking about it, Mark did not say anything about forgiving the man. He just talked along the lines of not attracting the infected to avoid the innocent from getting implicated. You should stop thinking about it madam. If Mark really wanted to make a move against Garcia, we won't be able to do anything but watch. The congresswoman sighed after she heard that. About the weapons and equipment, how was it divided? Mark just took a third of the guns and ammunition. The grenades were divided in half. He took three riot shields and five helmets and the rest are left to us. About the radios, he really did not take even a single unit. It is the same with the batons. I doubt that those batons would be of use even to us. The chief smiled bitterly. I think the same. I just brought those back just in case that there would be a need to it. What need? Firewood. Chief Mallory did not answer and Madame Laney continued. Still, I'm surprised that he did not take majority of the guns and ammunition L.C., he probably had his reasons. Inside the reception area, Mark sat with his legs crossed beside Charmaine while hugging Abigail. As an empath, he could subconsciously absorb the energy emitted by the emotions of other people. And of course, he could also do it consciously. 
The reason he was hugging Abigail at this moment was because she was emitting a faint bloodlust after wiping out the criminals in the police command center. To describe the little girl's situation, it was like an animal that was emitting a dangerous intent after slaughtering their prey and witnessing blood. Since that was the case, Mark hugged her and was currently absorbing her bloodlust while channeling the calming energy he had. Big bro. Your nose. Charmaine noticed blood dripping from his nose again and wiped it. Thanks. His nose started to bleed after using a mental pierce on that fat criminal a few minutes ago. Though the bleeding was not much, it was still it had not stopped even now. It seemed that he received a backlash after using the ability and losing a bit of control. Even if he managed to practice it, fully controlling the ability was still far away. Still, the progress he had in training this ability was way smoother compared to learning to control his adrenaline which lasted several years. He looked at his hand. He found that it was easier to direct the energy by channeling it to his arms and hand and releasing the energy to where his hand was facing. He wished that he would master it sooner so that he would not look like some guy with a delusional syndrome every time he used it. Mark looked at the bag of weapons, ammunition and equipment tied up together beside him. He actually wanted more of these but it would not fit any more inside the van. Furthermore, he only wanted to add some variety to his arsenal. After all, just like why he used the pistol instead of the assault rifle inside the command center, every situation had a suitable weapon to use. A person passed and stopped in front of them. She was one of the survivors here that was tasked to cook rice porridge. She placed three bowls of porridge in front of Mark and Charmaine and retreated. On the other side of the reception hall, the other survivors were relishing their first meal in the past two days. The ingredients used to cook this porridge were actually of low quality as it was the ingredients used to cook food for the detained inmates of the police station. The chief decided to also retrieve these ingredients from the command center along with some cooking tools and utensils. Despite the low quality and cheap ingredients, looking at the face of the survivors, it looked like that the bland porridge was on par with a restaurant cuisine. Mark tried to taste the porridge. I was not bad but quite salty. Charmaine on the side however started to devour the bowl of porridge. Don't eat too much. I know, bro. Mark started to feed Abigail. The little girl ate the porridge without saying anything. She did not seem to be picky about food. He thought about their anti-climactic battle against the criminals. It seemed that he overestimated them. They did not even put up a proper fight. It was like those corny action movies where the enemies were blindly coming for the protagonist just to be shot down. It slipped far from Mark's mind that their flawless victory was attributed to them and their superhuman abilities overpowering the group of criminals. At least, it did not become a troublesome matter. Few minutes passed. At the moment, Mark was thinking of a way to rescue the people at the health center. It was lucky for those people that the mutated woodman seemed to have no interest in attacking them and was busy of looking up at the strange fruit on the huge tree. The only way Mark could think right now was to lure the infected towards the street and make those people slip through the back of the building into the outside of the compound. They could traverse the farmland behind the compound and use the emergency exit behind the police command center. He tried to think of other ways but that was the only possible plan. They also needed to get rid of the infected that came flocking towards the police command center due to the noise the gunfight made. That funny screaming infected would be crucial to this. Mark just wished that that infected was still around. No, that infected should be around. Mark was sure of that. He had been noticing it but the infected seemed to be attracted around places where survivors dwelled. The more survivors hiding in the place, the more infected was wandering around. It was the same in the mall and was also the same here. Though, the infected did not seem to pinpoint where the survivors were staying. After eating, Mark met up with the chief and the congresswoman and discussed his plans with them. The two seemed to be apprehensive about his plan. However, they could not think of another and better plan either. And thus, they decided on how to execute and allocate the roles everyone should take on. 
This time, all the policemen and the bodyguards was decided to participate. Even the two bodyguards of the businessman were not an exception. The businessman was actually against his bodyguards participating but still conceded when he was warned for not contributing to the group and being a baggage to everyone. For this plan, Mark, Abigail and Chief Mallory and his subordinates would be the one to fetch the people at the health center while the bodyguards would go to the northern side of the roof to create a distraction and attract the infected away from the rescue group. During the whole discussion, Mark could not help but notice. The two were very careful of their words to him. They were afraid that they would offend him in any way. Day 3 to 10.42 a.m., Bacoer City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoer City, Cavita A group of people was wandering around the rooftop. Seven people were wearing suits, six were wearing police uniforms. With Mark, Abigail and Madame Laney added, there were 16 people participating in his plan. Actually, the chief and the congresswoman did not really need to participate in this but it seemed that they wanted to show Mark their sincerity. Mark did not stop them and just let them do what they wanted. Mark looked at the long metal poles by his feet. It was the metal poles that were on the rooftop of the command center earlier. It looked like the chief and his men did not slack when he asked for these. After rescuing those people in the health center, he would proceed and take that fruit up there. The other people were also interested in that fruit as they saw the golden glow it exudes but no one tried to make a move as Mark already declared his claim for it. After a little more preparation, they started the plan. The bodyguards at the north started shooting the infected on the street. They planned to make it like that to strike two birds with one stone. While they were killing the infected and thinning their numbers, they would also accomplish luring the others away from the rescue group. When the shootout at the northern part of the rooftop started, the rescue group at the south also made their move. Mark and his group waited for most of the infected to leave and went down to the back of the command center. They went around the back of the compound and made their way towards the back of the health center. Along the way, Mark was the only person who shot the incoming infected as the weapons the police had were not silenced. It was not because their station was under-equipped but because the inmates that took out the weapons from the armory did not seem to have the idea to also bring the gun suppressors and left the equipment at the armory that was brimming with the infected. It was still fine though as the number of straggling infected was not large. The policemen were also trained for close-quarter combat and was able to handle the infected without getting bitten. It was another issue if they got surrounded however. Abigail also played an important role on killing the remaining infected making the jaws of the policemen that did not participate in dealing with the criminals slack-jawed. She was even more efficient than these large-bodied men. Well, not all of them were large-bodied since two of the policemen were large-bellied. When they arrived behind the health center, the survivors inside that was informed through the radio beforehand was already waiting with excitement. They were carrying numerous bags and equipment. Some of the policemen went and carried the items. Everything was going smoothly and as planned. Everyone was in high spirits. Until. Chief Mallory saw Mark staring blankly again. He had a bad premonition. Mark, what's wrong? Mark looked at him. Why don't you listen? Hearing what Mark said, the chief strained his ears but what he could only hear were gunshots that were being fired indiscriminately. It should be the gunshots coming from the bodyguards that were luring the infected away. Then he froze as it registered into his brain. The gunshots were being fired indiscriminately. As if the people shooting were panicking. He then heard Mark once more. We should hurry. Something is not right. The chief nodded and ordered his men to hurry up. They all picked up their pace. Chapter 85 A Sudden Situation on the Rooftop You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3 to 10.42 a.m., behind Bacoer City Hall Compound, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoer City, Cavita observing the sounds of the gunshots, Mark deemed that something dangerous was happening at the rooftop. Was it another mutated, infected? The possibility was very high. He remembered the one that attacked Bernard's group on the rooftop of the mall. Ha! Huh. 
When the thought of Bernard and Calvin came into his mind, he felt some bad premonition. However, he had no time to dwell on this feeling at the moment. He hurriedly picked up the radio. Mayor. Check on what is happening on the rooftop. Yes. May's reply came in from the radio. The drone that was flying just above Mark flew up higher and made its way above the city health center. Let's go. Mark said to the chief. The police went into formation. They positioned themselves around the survivors that came from the health center. All the members of the police all brought riot shields with them making them the perfect shield for the survivors at the current situation. They all moved in an orderly fashion. They wanted to hurry up even more but were not able to do so. Among the survivors they saved, two were heavily injured and was barely able to walk, to talk about running with them. Is impossible. Soon, Mark's radio vibrated. Gidge. They are fighting something on the rooftop. What something? Another mutated infected. No. We can't see it clearly but not an infected. It looked like an animal. Wait, I see it. It's a... Dot several minutes ago. Madame Laney as in charge of command led the group of bodyguards to lure the infected towards their area of jurisdiction. The plan was going smoothly and as trained professional bodyguards, their shots were even more accurate than most low people in the police and the military. The street below them was being littered by numerous bodies of dead infected. They also found the screaming infected Mark Sawago and they followed his instructions upon seeing the infected. They did not kill it directly and just shot it at the non-dot-vital parts of its body. The infected screamed and lured more infected around as they expected. However, it disrupted their momentum. The voice of the infected was too awful to the ears that even the always serious-looking bodyguards were tickled to their bones. They only forced themselves not to laugh as the congresswoman was watching them. The corner of Madame Laney's lips also twitched when she heard the scream. She could see that the performance of the bodyguards were lessened. Stop giggling like high school girls and concentrate on your work. She yelled making the men all stiff. The congresswoman was a very nice person but it was the opposite when she got angry. After that, the continuation of the plan went smoothly again. It was too smooth that if Mark was here, he would feel that something was amiss. However, the man in question was not here and was with the rescue team. By the time that the rescue team finished helping the survivors make their way out of the health center, the dilemma started on the group at the rooftop. The bodyguards saw a black shadow running along the street agilely dodging the infected. One of the infected confronted the shadow but with a swipe of the shadow, the head of the infected flew away along with the splash of blood. It was then that the people by the rooftop saw what the shadow was. The shadow was actually a cat, a house cat with striped black, gray and white fur about the size of panther. The large cat noticed them and its slit-shaped eyes stared at them who were on the rooftop. Everyone felt the hair on their bodies raise up and their backs were covered in cold sweat. Two of the guards immediately retreated and went towards the congresswoman. Madam, we need you to return. It won't be simple this time. Madam Laney who also felt the threat could only nod and follow her bodyguard's request. However, before the two bodyguards was able to escort her away, another two bodyguards retreated and started to run away. The other people were dumbfounded. Madame Laney saw the two and it was Garcia's two bodyguards. Bang! 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 Madame Laney was about to order them to return to their post but she was disrupted by a sudden series of gunfires. Madam! Quick! Go inside! Another bodyguard who was shooting frantically shouted without regards to respect or superiority in ranks. It was because the situation suddenly became dangerous. The two cowards retreated because the huge cat on the street started to make its way towards them. How? It used the broken suspended pathway as a bridge. It agilely climbed up the dangling foundation and jumped onto the twisted roof of the pathway. Roy. Andrew. Bring the madam back inside. 
leave this to us. With that, the two bodyguards that warned the congresswoman first escorted her back inside in a hurry while the other three bodyguards stayed to confront the beast. Before the rooftop was out of the view of the congresswoman, she saw the large cat reach the rooftop and scathe despite the barrage of gunfire her bodyguards made. The three bodyguards that stayed put up a good fight. When the cat finally climbed up to the rooftop with a huge leap, they immediately retreated. You too, maintain your concentration. Keep support on each other or else, we'll perish here. All right. Good. The three brave bodyguards confronted the beast. They kept on shooting the huge cat forcing it to dodge and retreat but still, there were chances that the cat would find a hole to charge into. During those moments, the bodyguard who was being attacked would try to dodge with all their might in order to keep up with the beast's speed. The three bodyguards and the huge car were at a stalemate. However, that state did not last too long. Due to difference in strength, speed and stamina coupled with the fact that the bodyguards were undernourished these past two days, the first injury was received. The cat charged towards the leading guard and swiped its claws. The guard tried to jump back to dodge but the claws of the cat managed to reach his left arm. The sleeve of his suit was torn and three bleeding gashes appeared on his arm. The beast wanted to attack the bodyguard once more but it just became an opportunity to the injured guard as the cat stopped in front of him. Enduring the pain on his wounds, he suddenly pulled and pointed his gun forward and shot. The cat was caught off that guard and tried to dodge. The cat jumped away and was not hit by the shot directly but the shot still scraped some of its fur on its right front leg and also left a painful abrasion. The huge cat retreated and let out a painful howl. However, its fighting capability did not plummet but rose instead. It became angry due to receiving an injury from these puny humans. The cat attacked once more and the momentum of its attack was higher. Soon, the three bodyguards were all covered with wounds on their bodies. One of them was even clutching his wounded eye and face while gritting his teeth in pain. They knew that this was it. One of the three was already blinded while another could not even stand anymore as a large wound just below his right knee was visible. The last man was still standing but that was it. Both his arms were wounded and he was not able to attack or anymore. Even if he could still run, he was sure that this beast could catch up to him. The three were not in a condition to fight anymore and was only able to avoid not getting killed by supporting each other during dangerous times and forcing the beast to retreat. At this moment however, not only their bodies but their guns also gave up. They used up all their ammunition. This was the end for them. The huge cat charged once more. It was towards the bodyguard with injured leg. The man being attacked felt helpless and could only close his eyes in despair while he waited for his death. Mark and Abigail separated from the group after reaching the police command center. The two directly went to the rooftop while the policemen and the survivors entered the third floor. However, the survivors from the health center would not be escorted to the city hall anymore and would stay here in the command center. The policemen on the other hand would escort the people in the city hall towards the command center. The city hall was not safe anymore. No, even right at the moment that the huge tree sprouted, the city hall was a dangerous place already. With the state of the building where it looked like it had been devastated by a strong earthquake, it might collapse at any moment. The survivors there only stayed because they had no other place to go to. Now that the two upper floors of the command center were secured, the survivors there could now be relocated. The priority to be escorted out was the congresswoman and Charmaine while the other survivors were next on the line. The lowest on the priority however, was the businessman, Garcia, and his bodyguards. He was furious. The policemen did not even bother about him. No, it was not that they did not bother about him. They were looking at him from time to time. However, their eyes were filled with disdain. The congresswoman and the two bodyguards with her were also the same. What happened? He was confused. Was it because he ordered his bodyguards to retreat once danger arose? No. 
none of them should have known anything about it. If there was to be blamed here, then it would just be his bodyguards since no one knew about his orders. He was left out in the dark but could not do anything. If he tried to go against the congresswoman and the police chief, he would be branded as an enemy. He could only follow their procedures while gritting his teeth in anger. Garcia did not know that his order to his men was not leaked. Even the congresswomen had suspicions but were still not proven. The policeman and the congresswoman were behaving like this due to the actions his bodyguards made and also due to Mark. He offended him earlier and did not want to mingle with him anymore. His sin count was growing in numbers time and time again that he was starting to become the enemy of everyone here, especially the congresswoman. She received the news from the chief when he arrived. However, she held her anger inside. Now was not the time to create more conflict with the group. The father and daughter duo arrived at the rooftop of the city hall. They saw the mutilated bodies of the three bodyguards that stayed to fight the huge cat. Mark already expected this scene as May continuously relayed what was happening at the rooftop from the time that the congresswoman was escorted back inside to the time that the life of the last bodyguard was taken by the beast. The confrontation between the bodyguards and the huge cat only lasted for several minutes and there was no way for Mark and Abigail to arrive here on time to aid them. Before the rescue team could even reach the police command center, the three bodyguards had already died. And the culprit. It was now on a branch of the huge tree. It was no question what that beast was up to. It was also after the fruit on the tree. However, it seemed that it perceived the existence of Mark and Abigail that it stopped moving while staring at the two. Staring at the huge house cat, Mark remembered the information disclosed by the military. Everyone had the chance to evolve but animals and plants would evolve faster. This huge cat and the huge tree in front of them right now was the prime examples of those circumstances. Bam. 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 A loud sound could be heard from the northern side of the rooftop making everyone on the rooftop look over that direction. A few seconds later, a large bushy tree could be seen emerging from the unseen part of the building. It was that large mutated woodman. Just like how the huge cat climbed up to the rooftop, the woodman followed. Mark found it troublesome in many ways. It seemed that the infected were starting to learn methods to hunt their prey. If this mutated infected was able to learn how to climb accessible places, then, how about the others? But that was not the problem at this situation. All the beings here right now on the rooftop was after a single thing. It was the golden fruit on the huge tree. Chapter 86 Against the Level 2.Mutation Woodman You are listening at Novel Full.Audio Day 3 to 10.42 AM, Bacoor City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanan, Bacoor City, Cavita While the mutant woodman was struggling to climb up and Abigail was having a staring contest with the huge cat on the branch of the huge tree, Mark was fiddling with his phone and could be heard murmuring. Gunland Swordland. Ignite. Storm and fire. Mark was organizing his music playlist. As everyone was at a standstill and the mutant woodman had not climbed to the rooftop yet, he had enough time to select which songs would be suitable for the incoming fight. Why did he not start the fight immediately? It was because the survivors at the floor below had not finished evacuating from the city hall yet. While he was fiddling with his phone, he was actually scanning the floor below. Once the last survivor inside left, he would start attacking. Once the fight started, he did not know how long the building would be able to handle it. It was not because of him, the huge cat nor Abigail. One minor reason was the woodman, its weight and strength but the major reason was the huge tree in front of them. It should be in a sleeping state but would it get disturbed once the battle between non-humans started? It was very likely that it would. Once that happened, it was likely for the building to collapse. While Mark was arranging the songs on his phone, the last person inside the city hall left and the mutant woodman finally climbed to the rooftop almost at the same time. Mark immediately played the first song and stored his phone onto one of the pockets on his belt. After the mutant woodman climbed up, 
it displayed the common trait of every infected. It was to charge at their target. Every step of its heavy wooden feet created a mild tremor on the rooftop as it made its way as fast as it could. And the person it was charging towards was actually Mark. Mark looked at the approaching infected and then towards the huge cat that was not making any moves nor having the notion of snatching the fruit in front of it. It was strange but it was a situation to Mark's favor. It was a cat and a bigger mutation of a house cat. Just the speed of a normal cat was already hard to predict and react to then how about this cat in front of them. It would have a speed that was several times faster. Gail, guard that huge cat. Can you do it? Leave that large guy to me. Looking at her papa, Abigail nodded. This was the most reasonable tactics. Only her speed would be able to react to the speed that cat could display. Actually, Mark could just abandon the intention to fight and just evacuate the area along with the survivors as planned. However, his otaku instincts pushed him to not give up the fruit unless there was no other choice left. The fruit with golden color was very mysterious. From what Odlina said before, this fruit would benefit them. Then, it was a must to contest for it. There was also the feeling that it would not turn out to be a good situation if this huge cat or this mutant woodman was the ones to get the fruit. Leaving the little girl and the huge cat on their staring contest, Mark did not wait for the woodman to arrive and charged towards it. Mark did not activate his adrenaline rush and decided to confront the mutant woodman in a normal combat. It was not because he did not want to but because there was no need to. The woodman was large and strong but its weakness was its very stiff movements and very slow speed. If it was put in video games, this kind of creature was only suitable in attacking buildings of enemies. It was more of a tank than an attacker. As Mark arrived near it, the woodman swung its huge wooden arm down in attempt to squish him. Mark dodged to the left but the tremor on the rooftop slightly affected his footing and almost fell down. I need to be careful with the shaking. Bang. Mark had drawn the weapon he brought for this encounter. It was a standard issue shotgun for the Philippine National Police, a Remington 870. From his experience with the woodmen when they arrived here, his M16 assault rifle and his Beretta 92 pistol did not have enough firepower to penetrate the skin of a normal woodman, what more to this mutated one. After dodging, he shot the infected. Creak. Creaking noises sounded the as pellets from the shotgun sprayed on the wooden body of the infected. As Mark expected, hitting the larger wooden body would not affect the infected. Still, he tried shooting the bullet in vulnerable body to test and also to attract it further. Swoosh. The woodman swung its large wooden arm to swipe Mark away. Mark on the other hand already retreated away from the area of the attack. As a gamer, it was easy for him to pinpoint where its attacks were coming from. Every time it attacks, it would pull its arms away before attacking giving him a leeway to anticipate the attack and dodge. He would be an idiot if he got hit by this unless some unexpected situation happened. Bang! Mark shot again but this time, the shot was aimed at the smaller humanoid figure dangling at the center of the large wooden body. It should be its true body. Bam. Bam. The body was hit and the pellets from the shotgun shell buffeted the body. However, that was it. The pellets only bore shallow holes on the tree bark skin of the woodman. The only thing noticeable was it actually retreated two steps backwards making two loud banging sounds on the roof. Creak. Well, darn it. Mark immediately retreated backwards. Those two unexpected steps of the woodman made the rooftop let out creaking noises. It would be dangerous if the roof suddenly collapsed. Thinking of a plan, Mark glanced behind him. His eyes lit up. He began to retreat towards the eastern side of the rooftop. Why? It was the roof at the eastern part of the city hall was barely affected by the growth of the tree. It was the roof directly above the reception area where the survivors stayed before and there were no noticeable cracks on this area of the roof. The infected that had just recovered from being shot charged more ferociously. 
Mark could not feel any emotional fluctuations from the infected but the way it behaved showed that it was angered somehow. Its speed and strength even rose visibly. Swoosh. Bam. Dot the woodman slammed both its arms towards Mark that had already anticipated the attack. Mark agilely dodged but his back was feeling cold after that attack. It was good that he already lured the woodman to this side. That attack just now should be able to demolish the area of the rooftop where they were fighting before. Mark ran towards the left of the woodman trying to circle to its side. However, the woodman swiped its right arm towards its right forcing Mark to retreat further and halting his intended attack. As it was not possible to circle it, Mark aimed his shotgun forward and shot the smaller body once more. What? The shot did not hit the intended target. The left wooden arm of the woodman protected the true body from the shot. Damn it, this guy is learning things too fast. This woodman did not only learn how to climb. While fighting Mark, it was learning how to defend itself. As the fight was getting tougher, Mark remembered another video game where the players fight humongous beasts and defeat them. Was not his situation the same? Mark started to smile. The madman was starting to enjoy the fight. Bang. Kacha. Bang. Kacha. Bang. Circling to the right this time, Mark emptied the ammo of his shotgun before retreating. Since this guy was using its left arm to cover its true body, it was not able to swipe that arm when Mark circled to the right. Since you're learning how to defend, then, remain on defending. The true body was hit by two of the shots. A large number of holes were created at the true body of the woodman. It stumbled backward several times causing mild tremors on the rooftop. Using the time that it was pushed away, Mark hurriedly reloaded the shotgun and charged once more. He was not going to give the woodman another chance to attack. Bang! Bang! Mark shot twice. One was blocked while the other hit the true body once more. The woodman retreated further. Good. If it continued to retreat like that, Mark could push it to the edge of the rooftop and make it fall. Still, would that be easy? Mark suddenly looked at the area under the huge tree. The huge cat finally made a move. Mark could see two blurred shadows chasing each other around the trunk. He had a bad feeling as he saw their movements. Well shit. By the looks of it, he was also the target of the huge cat and Abigail was preventing it from moving towards him. He needed to deal with the woodman fast. However, when he looked back towards the woodman, he was stunned. The wooden body of the woodman slowly opened up and the hole swallowed its true body and closed up immediately. Now, the woodman looked totally like a tray ant. What am I going to shoot now? Mark smiled bitterly. He reached out to his belt and took out a small cork sealed glass vase about the size of his palm. It contained clear liquid inside. Flipping his belt, he had five of these glass vases. It was one of the things he prepared earlier after he decided to take that fruit. These glass bottles were from the mayor's office. These vases was put on a display cabinet there as decoration. As for the contents inside the vases, he was the one who filled the bottles. These bottles was actually for saved for the huge tree in case that it woke up and sudden situations arose from it but he had not thought that he would need to use one on this wood man. After swallowing the true body inside its large wooden body, it charged at Mark once more. Shush! Mark immediately jumped back as the woodman smashed its arms from above towards Mark again. The roof shook once more. After the attack, the woodman raised its arms once more to attack. At that moment, Mark actually charged forward at an inhumane speed and had thrown the glass vase in his hand towards the part of the body of the woodman where the true body was swallowed. The vase smashed spilling its contents on the body of the woodman. After the vase was thrown, Mark used the same speed to retreat as the arms of the woodman swung down once more. Full adrenaline rush concentrated on his feet. He finally decided to use this ability. Added with the fact that his legs were the most evolved part of his body, 
his speed could not be compared from the time he fought the berserk Odlina. At the moment that the arms of the hit the roof, Mark charged once more while he took out an electronic lighter. The lighter had a thick rubber band tied on its igniter to make the igniter stuck once the lighter was lit. Mark pushed the igniter and the lighter immediately let out a small flame. The igniter was stuck by the rubber band and the fire was not extinguished even after Mark let go of the igniter. With that, the lighter was the next thing he threw towards the body of the woodman. Blue. A loud sound was heard as the part where the liquid from the vase was spilled immediately burst into flames. Since its body was made of wood, flame was the bane of it. The woodman started going berserk. It was struggling to put out the fire but since it did not have elbows like humans, it could not reach the burning part of its body. It started to wildly swing its arms while trying to put out a fire. Still, the fire soon became weaker since the body of the woodman was not made of dried wood. If that was the case. Mark took out other vase and threw it adding fuel to the fire. The liquid inside the vase was actually butane. It was the contents of the two butane spray Mark brought with him. He felt that it was a loss since these vases was for the huge tree and surely was not enough but he needed to use up two vases for this guy. While the woodman was having a hard time putting out the fire, Mark gained the time to take a breather. But the situation did not let him to do so. His pupils dilated and he suddenly looked behind him. Papa. Gidge. Mark heard Abigail shouting. He could also hear May shouting from the radio in shock. When Mark turned around, he could see the claws of the huge cat approaching his face. Chapter 87 Abigail You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Day 3 to 1103 AM, Bacoor City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanen, Bacoor City, Kavita Mark could see the claws of huge cat coming closer from his left. The huge cat seemed to have slipped out of Abigail's interception and rushed towards him when he was concentrated on trying to burn the woodman despite its strong attacks. This feeling. It was similar to the time he encountered the first infected he killed in the mall. He was in the verge of death after a sudden ambush. His eyes dilated but he did not panic but his concentration heightened in that millisecond. Everything slowed down in his eyes as he heard Abigail and May's screams. Reflex. His heightened reflexes that were cultivated in playing fast past games kicked in once more. Mark made a step back with his left leg evading the initial contact. Without knowing and thinking about his movements, he bent his body backwards and did a fast back walkover with his left arm as support. Since the speed he did the tumble was too fast, he added another backflip to mitigate the impact his feet would receive upon stopping. He was surprised after the backflip. Mark did not know how he was able to do that move. His body moved subconsciously at the last second and he evaded the fatal attack. However, he did not get out of the situation unscathed. Since his right arm was holding the shotgun, the arm's movements were slower than the other parts of his body. The huge cat's claws managed to hit his arm. The sleeve of his jacket was torn and there was four bloody, centimeter deep slits on his skin. The flesh of his arm could be seen as the slits tore through all the layers of his skin. The flesh was immediately covered behind the flow of blood dyeing his black jacket with a reddish hue and the blood started to drip on the roof. Mark saw the flow of blood on his arm but his face did not change at all. Yes, it was painful. But Mark was the kind of person that never displayed pain on his face for something like this. However, it would hard to use his arm like this. He looked at the assailant that attacked him. He smiled. It seemed that the cat was confused on how he was able to dodge the attack it made. The huge cat recovered from its stupor and posed to charge at Mark once more but its movements were cut off. With dilated eyes, it suddenly turned its head away from him and posed to dodge. Mark did not let it do what it wanted to. He did not need to look but he knew that someone got angry at the moment. His eyes glowed red and he raised his wounded arm. Mental Pierce The energy composed of negative emotions flowed towards the unguarded mind of the cat. 
Its body froze and could only stare at the attack it was about to dodge that was coming towards it. Abigail stood several meters away from the tree while intently watching the huge kitty that was not really paying attention to her. Her papa already said it that this huge kitty was hers to guard. During the time her papa was intensely battling the mutated woodman, the huge kitty was watching her papa in confusion. As if it was thinking of something. After her papa started to get the upper hand on his fight with the woodman, the huge kitty started to make its way down of the tree. It its target was her papa. Abigail became sullen. This huge kitty must not disturb her papa's fight. Bam! Before the huge cat was able to land on the roof, the little girl already made her move. She anticipated where the cat would land and charged towards the location. She tried to welcome the huge cat with a fast kick and succeeded since the huge cat was not paying attention to her. The cat was hit below its abdomen and panther-sized cat was sent flying. It rolled in the air before the gravity pulled it down. Yet, as a cat, it regained its balance before it fell. The arrogant cat became angry as this little human that it did not put into its eyes was able to send it flying. However, it did not change its intent and still tried to charge towards Mark. But it did not let down its guard any more against the little girl. Noticing its intent, Abigail immediately charged at the huge kitty once more. Since the cat was now aware of her speed and strength, it was not caught by her attack and agilely dodged. The chase between the huge cat and the little girl commenced. Still, it was just the Abigail attacking the huge cat and preventing it to get on her papa's fight. On the other hand, the cat only dodged the little girl's attacks and proceeded on trying to approach the fight between Mark and the woodman. Two blurs, one black and one red, chased around the southern half of the rooftop which even took several minutes while Mark was fighting the mutated woodman. The huge cat seemed to have realized that it could not shake off Abigail from blocking its way and attacking it. It started to fight back. It made a huge and fast swipe towards the little girl which she easily dodged. Abigail counter-attacked but was also dodged by the huge cat. The huge cat charged with all its might towards Abigail forcing her to retreat back. It was unknown to the limited knowledge of the little girl that the cunning cat was just baiting her into retreating. As the little girl retreated, the huge cat immediately turned around and charged towards Mark. The little girl who was caught off guard was not able to react in time. Even if she was able to react to it, it was already late as the speed between her and the cat was not that far. If she chased the cat even at the moment it turned around, she would still not be able to block it. The poor Abigail paled when she saw her papa who was caught off guard. The huge kitty flexed its right paw making its sharp claws stuck out of its fingers. The huge kitty was aiming for the kill. It was aiming to kill her papa. Papa. She shouted. Abigail saw that her papa managed to dodge but his arm was still struck on his arm. For bloody slits was visible on his arm and her papa's blood overflowed from those wounds. The blood continuously flowed out and dripped on the white-colored roof staining it with red spots. Her emotions flared up as she remembered what happened to her before and during the outbreak. The night before the outbreak, she was bitten by the pet ragdoll of her grandma. It was because she accidentally stepped on the tail of the cat that it attacked her and bit her on her right arm. She cried because of the pain but her grandma was more worried about the cat than her. Her mommy on the other hand immediately took care of her wound wiping it clean and put her to sleep saying that the pain would be gone after she woke up next day. It looked fine for the whole night until the morning that her mommy found out that she was flaring with high fever. Her mommy immediately panicked and decided to bring her for a checkup. On contrary, her grandma did not seem to be bothered by it and just said that it was just a fever for her mommy for panic. Her grandma did not really like her. Mommy said that it was because grandma hated daddy. From what she remembered, she never had a daddy unlike other children she knew. Her mommy said that he left her after learning that she was pregnant. There were times that Abigail could see her mommy looking at a picture on her phone with a sad look. She did not know why. 
Ednell.co After leaving the house, her mommy drove their car and they made their way towards the nearest private hospital. However, they got stuck in the traffic. Her fever continued to rise inside the car making her mommy panic even more. The part of her arm that was bitten by the cat the night before was swelling already. It was then that they were struck by the sudden chaos. A huge accident happened on the intersection that they were supposed to go through. Then the infected appeared. Her mommy carried her on her arms and left the car stuck in the middle of traffic. Unfortunately, her mommy was swept away by the crowd of people trying to escape. While she and her mommy were in the middle of the panicked crowd, she felt a stinging pain on her arm. The pain was too sudden that she did not know what happened. She looked at her arm and saw an elementary school girl biting her arm. The eye of the girl was all white and her face was filled blood. Abigail's mommy saw what happened to her and pulled her away out of panic. Luckily, the bite was just shallow but her right arm was still filled with blood. The school girl that bit her arm lost its target looked at her mommy. It attacked her and tried to bite her. Her mommy tried to dodge and fight back but was still bitten by her leg since her mommy was protecting her. Abigail's mommy managed to shake off the infected schoolgirl was both her and her mommy was injured and bitten. Her mommy carried her away to escape but still lagged behind since she was wearing heels. Not bother about it anymore, her mommy removed her shoes and started to run barefooted. Still, her mommy's injuries made it hard for her to run fast. Along the way, they saw a lot of horrible scenes along with the fact that someone bitten would turn and attack other people. The little girl was still innocent about it but despair had already enveloped the heart of her mommy. Since there was no place to hide, her mommy ran together with other people into the mall and tried to find a place to hide. But that was just easy to say but hard to do. With the infected on their tail, just a little more time and it would be their death. At the last moment when her mommy started to get weaker, she saw the counter of the large store on the first floor of the mall. Her mommy put her under the counter and left. Abigail could clearly remember what she said before she was gone. Stay here and hide for mommy all right. Remember what I always told you. Don't cry and keep calm at every situation like mommy. Mommy will pick you up later, all right. She was an obedient little girl and tried to stay as quiet as possible. Still, when her mommy left, she poked out her head over the counter to see her mommy once more. And that once more was the last. She saw her being attacked by an infected and was ganged upon several of them. Her mommy did not cry for help nor screamed for pain. It seemed that she noticed Abigail looking at her and she turned her head to look at her. Her mommy opened her lips and spoke but there was no voice that came out. Still, Abigail recognized what she said. Her mommy always said it to her. In the morning and before her sleep, her mommy would say it to her. I love you sweetie. Tears started to flow out of her eyes and decided to follow what her mommy told her. Abigail hid under the counter. She tried to keep herself calm as her mother always told her. However, she started to feel her body getting weaker and she fell unconscious. When she woke up, she was lying on a pool of blood together with mangled bodies around her on the floor. She vaguely remembered what happened. It was her who did this when she was unconscious. With her body, face and clothes stained in blood, she hid under the counter once more. It was then that he came, a man with a scary aura. Strangely, she did not feel scared and just curiously stared at him. He then wiped off the blood on her face and arms in a gentle manner and brought her away when things got dangerous. The one thing that she liked about the man was that his embrace was really warm and comfortable. It was like when she was being hugged by her mommy. She had even fallen asleep in his arms. She decided that time that he would be her papa since she did not have one at all. She really longed for one. And fortunately, she had not chosen the wrong person. He really took care of her and doted on her for the past day. And now, her papa was in danger. Her grandma hated her and she had no daddy. Her mommy was also gone and the only one she had her chosen papa. 
this huge kitty was trying to kill her papa. The aura of the little girl erupted and charged at the huge kitty with all her might. While she was running, her wavy black hair started to turn white. Her nails on her fingers grew and turned into curved sharp claws. A bushy white tail emerged from her back that could be seen under her skirt and two triangular ears sprouted on her head. With that new form of hers, Abigail let out a full-strength kick towards the huge cat in front of her papa. Chapter 88 The Rampage of the Mutated Tree You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3 to 11.04 a.m. Bacoor City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoor City, Cavita B.A.M. The huge house cat flew several meters away and rolled on the roof before stopping. It was only about two to three meters away from the northern edge of the rooftop. Due to Mark's action, it received the full brunt of Abigail's kick causing the scene. Mark looked at the little girl with white hair, fluffy tail and cat ears in front of him. The little girl turned to him and he could see her worried eyes and her pupil that also changed color into a red hue. Seeing this, he forgot about the pain in his arm. This surely was a stunning sight. He already expected something like this somehow. From the information the military disclosed, the mutagen altered the mutator's bodies. It was pretty much like Odellina's condition before. Her body was covered with grey bone armor. He felt that it was strange that Abigail did not seem to have that form. Still, when Odlina turned into her normal appearance, Mark then concluded the possibility of Abigail being the same. However, he did not expect that her mutated form would be like this. As her papa stood there staring at her, Abigail grew more worried and even scared. She was worried about her papa's bleeding wound and was scared that her papa would hate her since she looked like this. She remembered it vaguely. During the time she fell unconscious that time, she turned into this appearance and killed the infected around her without her knowing. Still, she did not know how she returned to normal. She did not know what other people would react to her looking like this. Like a monster. The eyes of her grandma who always looked at her with hate were deeply ingrained in her young mind. What if her papa looked at her like that? Mark stared at her for a bit. He was confused why Abigail was worried about him but was afraid to come over. He could sense it vaguely since the subconscious emotion of this little girl was still occupied by calmness. The energy leaking out from her other emotions were too weak. His confusion cleared up as he thought about it. He approached the little girl who even stepped back subconsciously. Mark shook his head and continued approaching with a smile. His smile however was different to his usual bitter and indifferent smile. The distance between them was short, just about four meters which Mark easily traversed while his wounded arm dripped blood on the path. The first thing he did after arriving in front of the little girl was to kneel down to her eye level and caress her head gently. He could feel the triangular ears on her head. The sensation was similar to patting a cat's ear. At this moment, his gentle movements erased the fear on the girl's eyes. What are you afraid about? Papa won't hate me. Hate you for what? I look like this. Abigail showed her tail and waved her fingers that had two-inch-long claws. Why will I hate you for this? It looked cute all right. Mark laughed. In his mind, it was funny. The little girl actually asked an otaku if he will hate her current appearance. Don't worry about your appearance. Even if the whole world will hate you for that, I will the only one who won't. He gave the little girl a hug while being careful that he would not stain the little girl's beautiful white hair with his blood. Let's go. The bad kitty is standing up. Mark let go of Abigail and stared at the huge cat that was struggling to stand up. The little girl's kick hit it on its shoulder. Now, it was visible that it was injured as it was having a hard time to stand up and could not use its left foreleg. After it finally stood up, it was limping and its left foreleg was raised every time it moved. To the northeast side of the rooftop, the mutant woodman was still struggling to put out the fire but it was not able to. Rather, the fire had already spread to other areas of its body. The woodman was not a threat anymore. 
sooner or later, it would turn into ashes. Mark decided to concentrate on fighting the huge cat together with Abigail. This time, he could not use his shotgun anymore and switched his weapon to the pistol on his belt. As Mark was ready to continue the fight, Abigail also got ready to charge towards the huge cat. However, when they were about to attack, the huge cat ran away from them. It was a wise decision as it knew that it could not fight the two people in front of it. Another round against Mark and Abigail would make fall into its death. Still, it did not want to give up on the fruit. When it ran away, the direction it ran towards was the huge tree. Realizing its intention, Mark shouted. Gail. Chase it. Don't let it take the fruit. Under her papa's command, she charged towards the cat. Her speed was about twice as before and her strength was also enhanced in this form of hers. However, the cat was closer to the tree. Before the little girl could reach the cat, it agilely climbed up the tree using its remaining legs. Upon reaching the branch of the huge tree, it immediately lunged towards the fruit. It tried to bite it and eat it in one go. Luckily, because of its injuries, the strength of the huge cat was lessened severely and its jump was shorter than it intended. It failed to bite the fruit and started to fall. In the last moment before the gravity pulled it back down, it spun its body midair with its back facing down. It tried to use its remaining forelimb to reach the fruit which it succeeded. Dot pierced by its claw, the fruit was plucked off the branch of the tree and fell with the cat. Rumble. Mark and Abigail stopped in place. The huge cat was still in midair falling with the fruit so it did not notice. The whole building was shaking. Crash. Crack. The remaining glass windows and walls of the city hall on the floors below shattered. The cracks on the walls and ceilings grew larger. The mutated woodman that was on fire went out of balance and fell off the edge of the rooftop. Like normal cats would do, the huge cat landed back on the roof upright while the fruit landed beside it. When the huge cat landed, it became still. It did not try to get the fruit and jumped away like someone stepped on its tail. Just as the huge cat jumped, the roof where the cat landed before burst in rubble as a large root bore a basketball-sized hole upwards. The root started to destroy the roof as it chased the huge horrified cat to death. Mark looked at the huge tree. It was finally awakened. He could feel that it was really angry. Gail. We're going to leave. Mark started to run towards the police command center and it was not easy. The whole building was crumbling and more of those huge roots started to pierce through the floors and the roof. The rooftop was shaking wildly and Mark almost lost balance several times. On the other hand, Abigail who heard her papa's shout did not want to abandon the fruit especially since the fruit was rolling towards her position. It was swept away by the force the first root created when it appeared. The little girl rushed towards the fruit and grabbed it before running. It was then that the root started to emerge under Abigail's feet forcing the little girl to jump every now and then while running to dodge. The huge cat that was first chased by the roots had already jumped off the building like a rat jumping into its hole while it was being chased by a cat. It looked ironic and its fate after jumping was unknown. By the height of the building, even if the huge cat did not die, it would receive at least another fractured leg. If it managed to escape, unless it had fast regeneration, its life would still end soon. On the rooftop of the police command center, several people stood watching the situation in the rooftop of the city hall since the start. Among the people, there was Chief Mallory, Madame Laney and Charmaine who was being assisted by the nurse. Despite Charmaine's weak condition, she wanted to know and watch what kind of fight her big brother was participating at. There were also the bodyguards and other policemen along with some of the survivors who were curious and brave enough to watch. At the back though, there was a terrified man and his two bodyguards. Their backs were covered in sweat as they watched what was happening. What the people were watching was akin to the scenes from those fantasy movies. Mark's fearlessness as he confronted the nine-foot wooden giant was shown in their eyes. 
The speed Abigail displayed as she tried to block the path of the beast and the sudden change in her appearance was also witnessed by them. Now, the scene of a tidal wave made of large wooden roots chasing the little girl made them all shiver inside. This scene was unearthly. Are we really still on earth? If we are, then everyone is screwed. Almost all these people alike had those thoughts. It was except for Garcia and his bodyguards. Their minds were filled with fear and panic. They actually offended such monsters. Garcia decided to hide. These monsters in human skin must not see him or he would be dead for sure. On the other hand, Charmaine was really worried for the two who were fighting on the rooftop. However, she could only clench her palm as she could not do anything but watch them. Also her big brother was injured. Just how deep were his wounds for blood to gush out and stain his sleeves? In the rooftop of the city hall, the danger had not decreased, it had actually increased. Like how the people watching on the rooftop of the command center described it, it was like a tidal wave of roots. It was currently chasing Abigail who was intensely dodging the incoming roots. Mark watched the scene in a grave manner. The rooftop started to collapse and Abigail was being chased by countless roots of different sizes. Abigail. Drop that fruit. Hearing his voice, the little girl was about to drop and leave the fruit. However. Boom. Rumble. The part of the roof between Mark and the suspended pathway collapsed. They were stranded on the rooftop. Damn it. You're forcing me. Mark rushed back towards Abigail and with a catching pose, he shouted at the little girl. Throw it to me. The little girl threw the fruit towards her papa while continuously dodging the roots attacking her. On the other side, Mark hurriedly caught the fruit and rushed towards the west side of the roof. The roots charging towards Abigail halted and changed their target. The roots made their way towards Mark with fast speed. Boom. Boom. Rumble. Several roots pierced their way up the roof under Mark's feet but he managed to dodge by running on a zigzag. Once he felt a stronger shaking by his foot, he would immediately kick on the roof and push his body sideways. Mark retrieved a vase and another lighter from his belt. He lit the lighter first before smashing the vase on the roof. After the butane was spread, he threw the lit lighter creating a sudden fire halting some of the roots. Another root appeared from under the roof and Mark was not in the position to dodge. In that moment, he raised his wounded arm again and his eyes glowed red brightly. His nose started to bleed again though. It was another mental pierce and the target was the tree. Since the tree had some sort of sentience, then, it must work. Then, the root that was about to hit him halted and started to shiver. The other roots also behaved the same. It seemed that it was severely affected by Mark's mental attack. The huge trees soon recovered but Mark was already at the edge of the roof together with Abigail. At that moment, the tree did not dare move. It was because Mark was holding the fruit over the edge of the roof. Chapter 89 Conclusion of the Battle for the Golden Fruit You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3 to 11.09 AM, Bacoor City Hall Rooftop, Molino Boulevard, Bayanin, Bacoor City, Kavita Mark kept holding the golden fruit over the edge while sighing in relief. What he just did was a risky gamble. A very huge and risky gamble. However, there's nothing else for them to lose by counting on this gamble since they were already at risk. If did not work, then he would just find another way. There was no need to find another way though. Mark won the gamble. There were several reasons why he ended in taking up this gamble. First, he noticed that the tree was angry but had no killing intent at all. All it wanted was to take back the fruit and they would just be collateral damage. Another was because every single time that the fruit was flung into the air or falling down, Mark could feel anxiousness coming from the tree. It was as if the tree was worried about the fruit getting severely damaged or even destroyed when it falls down. Since that was the case, what if he threatened this tree? What if he showed it that he would throw the fruit away if it did not stop? 
since it had sentience, it would realize his intention right. He was right and he succeeded. The tree stopped moving and it was now exuding the feelings of fear. Mark could feel its emotions. It was faint but he was sure of it. The huge tree was afraid that he would throw the fruit off the edge. Mark looked at the huge tree. He now realized. It was not that the sentience of the tree was faint because it was not human nor animal. The emotional fluctuations were similar to what he felt from other children. The sentience was weak maybe because it was newly born. Looking towards the tree, Mark shouted. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Shake your roots if you do. Abigail looked at her papa. Who was he talking to? The people at the rooftop of the command center were also baffled by Mark's actions. Was he talking to the tree? Did he also hit his head? But to everyone's surprise, the roots that covered almost the whole of the rooftop started shaking as if it was responding to what Mark said. No. The tree was really responding to him. The roots of the tree shook for several seconds before stopping. Do you want this back? Mark shouted once more while waving the fruit on his hand. The roots shook once more in response. Mark could feel the emotion from the tree. It was pleading. The emotions the tree was showing were too pure and innocent. Mark sighed. It felt like he was bullying a child. He then looked at Abigail. Gail, sorry but we need to return it. Abigail shook her head. It was not right for her papa to apologize for this. Looking back at the tree, Mark shouted again. Help us return back there first and you can have this fruit. Mark pointed at the suspended pathway. At that moment, as if taken from a scene in a fantasy movie, the wave of roots receded and slowly intertwined together creating a wooden bridge. The bridge connected the collapsed parts of the rooftop and continued towards the suspended pathway. Seeing that, everyone was amazed. It looked like a scene from a fairy tale and it only lacked the vines and flowers to look perfect. Since Mark did not feel any ill intent from the tree. He directly led Abigail through the wooden bridge towards the suspended pathway. Doing this, Mark felt like he was transported to another world. He was walking on a fantasy-like bridge with the huge tree to his left and he was leading a cat-eared girl on his side. The father and daughter soon reached the safety of the suspended pathway. Mark turned back. It was to fulfill his end of the deal. He felt that it was a pity that he would not be able to get the fruit for Abigail and Odlina but it was better to return it unless they did not want to keep their lives anymore. Dot cheating the tree. That was more impossible. Even if he could escape with Abigail right away, he would not be able to bring Charmaine. Mark stretched his left arm that was holding the fruit towards the tree. Soon, a smaller root approached Mark's hand and coiled onto the fruit. It then took the fruit towards its trunk. As the root holding the fruit approached near its body, a small hole opened up on the trunk. The fruit was put inside the hole before it closed. Seeing that, Mark shrugged his shoulders. He just wasted his time and even got injured for nothing. Well, he was not worried about his injury since he was more worried on where to find a change of clothes now. His right sleeve was torn and his blood stained almost the entire right half of his clothes. He was about to turn around to return when something tapped on his shoulder. When he looked, it was another small root. Realizing the intention of the tree, Mark did not leave immediately. Soon enough, Two roots, one coming from below the suspended pathway and other coming from below the trunk approached him. Both roots were coiled into something. The root that tapped his shoulder pulled his uninjured arm up and placed the two items being coiled by the two other roots on his hand. The two items looked extraordinary. One was a shard-shaped purple crystal. It looked beautiful but it was rough and unpolished. The crystal was about the size of his index finger. The other item was an odd-looking seed. It was shaped like a watermelon seed but was red in color and was about the size of his thumb. What are these? Mark did not hesitate to ask even if he looked like someone crazy while talking to a tree. 
The root in front of Mark then pointed at the crystal and then below the suspended pathway. Mark followed what it was pointing at below and saw the body of the dead mutated cat being eaten by the infected. This crystal is from that huge cat. The root shook in confirmation. Then this seed, is it yours? Mark was confused with the seed. He did not think that the huge tree would give him something like its seed since it did not even want to let go of the fruit. And as if to confirm his thoughts, the root shook sideways. This seed is not yours. Then what seed is this? There was no response from the tree. It seemed that it also did not know. Mark's face turned black and decided to let his feelings go. If the tree did not know about it, then, there was nothing they could do about it. At least, it gave him something in return. Also since it was from that mysterious tree, it should be something rare. Since he was given something, Mark decided to say his gratitude. After all, even though the tree was threatening, it was like his initial thoughts before. It was not hostile to people. It just behaved dangerously due to the fruit suddenly being stolen. It was confusing though. What would this huge tree want to do with its own fruit? Well, it was not of his concern anymore. Thanks for these. Mark said and shook the root with his hand like he was shaking another person's. Mark stored the two items in one of the pockets on his jacket and left with Abigail. After the two started walking away, the roots started to reseed and the huge tree became dormant once more. However, the city hall was left almost crumbling. When Mark and Abigail returned, the very first person to approach them was Charmaine who was being assisted by the nurse. Big brother, are you okay? Charmaine worriedly asked as she stared at Mark's blood-covered arm. It's a little painful but I'm fine. It's just a scratch you see. Big bro. That pun is lame. It's not a pun though. It's really just a scratch. Mark then wiped the blood using the sleeve of his other arm. With Charmaine's gasp, the wounds that had already started to heal were revealed. The wounds were not bleeding anymore as the wounds had already closed up. See. It'll be fine in a few hours. Not only Charmaine but the other people who were nearby were shocked. They saw how much blood was gushing out of his wounds and it was healing already. Bro. Really, what is happening? The zombies and those creatures. Then, you and Gale. When Charmaine said that, she looked at the white-haired girl with cat ears who was holding Mark's hand. You know something right. Most of the people around also had the same question. However, unlike Charmaine, no one dared voice out their questions in fear of offending the mysterious father and daughter. The congresswoman and the police chief also approached at this moment. I also think the same. I had been suspecting that you knew something. Could you please make it clear to us? What is really happening? Madame Laney asked with an inquisitive but humble tone. She really wanted to know what she needed to know but she also wanted to maintain a good relationship with these people. On the other hand, Mark's face was turning dark. However, it was not Mark but the little girl who spoke. Mew. Annoying people. Abigail was also dissatisfied. Except for Charmaine and the nurse, the little girl started glaring at everyone. Her red eyes really looked terrifying at this moment. Mark patted the little girl's head and looked at the congresswoman. Can we talk about it later? We're tired you see. Madame Laney scratched her subconsciously. It was an act unbefitting her status. Sorry about that, I got carried away because of everything we just saw. Mark then nodded. He looked at Charmaine and signaled her with his chin to follow. He then walked towards the door with Abigail with Charmaine and the nurse behind. All the people in front of them hurriedly moved to the side to make way for their group. After entering, Mark glanced behind and asked. Charm, where are our things? It's the room beside the chief's office I think. Why there? I don't know. Madame Laney brought me to that room. Walking down the stairs and out of the hallway, they immediately found the room. When they entered, 
Mark realized how much effort the congresswoman's group gave in order to make the room as comfortable as possible. It was an office room but there was a bunker bed moved here. The cluttered mess left by the outbreak was also cleaned up and all the unnecessary things inside the room were removed. Mark plopped his body on one of the office chairs and yawned. He then reached out for the bag he brought and took one of the insulated bottles that contained soda. Flipping the bag on his belt, he took out two medicines, a capsule and a tablet. It immediately consumed the medicine as he was already feeling the effects of excessive use of adrenaline. The nurse helped Charmaine onto the bed and went out of the room hurriedly. Mark noticed it. Is she afraid of us? I don't think so. Charmaine replied. Why did she hurry out then? Charmaine did not answer anymore. She was also confused. Abigail approached her papa while staring at his wounds. Papa. Does it hurt? Just a little. Mark patted the little girl's head. In this form of hers, the texture of her hair was really comfortable to touch. He then lifted the concerned girl up and made her sit on his lap. He then stared at the cat ears on her head then looked for her human ears. It's really not there huh? What is it papa? Abigail was curious. Your human ears, it's not there anymore. Can you still turn back to normal? Um. The little girl was seriously thinking. I can. But don't know how. She found her answer in her mind and was crestfallen. Is that so? Then let me try. Mark then hugged Abigail tightly. After about a minute or two, he features started going back to normal. The change was visible to his eyes. To describe her transformation, it was like her cat ears and tail was being absorbed by her body while her human ears sprouted like how her cat ears appeared before. So, it was really the case. Mark murmured. Abigail on the other hand touched her head checking if her cat ears were still there or not. Papa, how? You're just too agitated. Mark smiled. The cause to Abigail's transformation seemed to be her emotions. Her calm emotion that Mark always felt from her was being shared with agitation while she was in that form. It also seemed to be the case why the shy girl managed to voice out her dissatisfaction towards the people earlier. Chapter 90 An Insidious Plan You are listening at NovelFull.audio Day 3-12.00 NN Bacoor City Police Command Center 3rd Floor, Molino Boulevard, Bayanan, Bacoor City, Kavita Madam Laney and Chief Mallory just went out of the room Mark and the three girls were staying. The two wore bitter face after learning everything from Mark. After Mark rested enough, he asked the nurse taking care of Charmaine to call the two and tell them the things the government disclosed back in the mall. He also summarized a bit of his encounter with the military and what happened at the mall. Still, he did not tell everything. He hid things like he had a satellite phone and he could contact the military based at the Bay City. There was no point in telling this to them right now. Actually, it was not that there was really no point but he just did not want to be pestered about when would the rescue arrive and stuff like that. More than that, this phone was personally given to him by Angeline. It was not a government property for them to demand its use. The two leaders would be the ones to inform the other survivors about the situation. They also told Mark that they were already preparing to leave this place. At this moment, Mark could hear a lot of gunshots from outside the window. The bodyguards and the police along with other able people were moving to procure some of the government vehicles outside. Once enough vehicles were gathered, everyone would hurry up and leave this place. Mark and Abigail's fight at the city hall rooftop opened the eyes of the people here. This place was not safe at all. Unless they had the ability and skills like the two displayed at the rooftop, they would not survive just by staying at this flimsy and small building. In the room, Mark was also preparing his things. Abigail on the other hand was taking a nap using Charmaine's lap as a pillow. The full usage of her abilities at the rooftop drained the little girl a lot. T-O-K. Talk. Two knocks sounded at the door and it opened. 
It was the nurse who was taking care of Charmaine. Apparently, after the doctors and nurses were rescued, they divided to work on treating the injured survivors. On the other hand, this nurse was assigned to solely take care of Charmaine. The nurse was holding two small bags. He handed one of the bags to Mark. Here are the medicines you wanted. All right. Mark took the bag and bundled it with the things he will bring back. In the bag were Charmaine's insulin shots and other medicine of common illness like cold and fever. As for the painkillers and other stuff, he had a lot of stock back in the vehicle so he did not ask for more. After giving the bag of medicine to Mark, the nurse sat beside Charmaine and the two women started chatting with each other. Mr. Mark. The nurse called out to him. Just Mark is fine. Adding Mr. to my name gives me cringes. Okay then, Mark. Is Charm's proposal for me before still valid? I know I did not give my answer earlier but. You want to come with us? Charmaine interjected with a happy face. Yes. I decided to come with you if possible. The nurse answered Charmaine's question before turning at Mark. After all, he was the one with the final say. It's fine if Charm wants you to go with us. Still, what changed your mind? Mark was curious. The nurse inhaled and exhaled deeply before answering. I'll be frank. Your fight at the rooftop shook me. I know Madame Laney said that we are going to a safer place but I doubt that the place is really safe. So I thought that going with your group would be safer. She looked straight at Mark and continued. I know that I'm being presumptuous but in exchange for the protection I will get, I'll work hard for anything I can do. Even if you wanted something like my body I won. Wait. Wait. Stop. You're going the wrong way. Mark stopped her with a darkened face. Charmaine also hurriedly spoke with a flushed face. Yeah. What are you saying? Don't tell me you fell in love with Big Brother. Charmaine's voice trailed off as she received a stern stare from her big brother. With a serious face, the nurse replied. I didn't. I'm not falling in love or something like that. I just know that I needed to give something as exchange and all I have is myself and nothing else. Don't tell me, you're that kind of woman. I'm not. Mark stared at the nurse and sensed her emotions. She was actually not that willing to say or do it but she was determined to give up everything she had as long as she could live. Jeez. All right. He decided to accept the nurse's determination or rather, desperation. Big brother. Don't tell me. What kind of dirty things are you thinking about? Can you use some bleach to cleanse your brain a bit? Goo. With that, Charmaine became quiet. Looking back at the nurse, Mark spoke once more. I'll let you come with us and you will fulfill what you just said except the last one. Hearing that, the nurse felt relieved and somehow insulted at the same time. She was relieved that she did not need to resort to giving up her body but felt insulted since she seemed to not have any charm on Mark's eyes. She was still a woman. Even if she was not beautiful, her looks was still above average. But to Mark, she seemed to be just an ugly woman. Then she came to a realization and she voiced it out subconsciously. Are you impotent? Cough. Cough. Mark choked on his saliva because of what he just heard. Where the hell did that come from? I'm perfectly normal. It seemed that Abigail was disturbed from her nap because of the noise they were making. She slowly opened her eyes and rubbed it. The little girl then stood up and walked towards her papa. Papa is angry. Mark patted her head. I'm not. The little girl nodded and sat on his lap without asking him. Everyone was speechless after that though. It was because Abigail started glaring at the nurse without anyone knowing why. The little girl just sat on his lap while staring at the nurse without saying anything. Abigail's glare made the nurse shiver inside. It was as if the little girl was telling her not to bully her papa. Mark on the other hand sighed. Why is it harder to talk to women nowadays? 
it was even harder than killing a dozen infected. With that, the room finally became quiet. Mark continued with his work while Abigail sat on his lap staring at the nurse. The nurse on the other hand did not try to move or talk under the little girl's watch. To the side, Charmaine could only smile bitterly. The little girl was actually scarier than the father. Fifteen minutes later, Chief Mallory came in to tell them that the vehicles were ready and they could leave any time. It was faster than he anticipated. With that as the signal, Mark called on his radio. Mayor, are you there? Gidge. Are we going to fetch you already? It was an immediate reply and even the subject for the call was not needed to be discussed. May's voice even sounded happy. Yeah. Are you watching what is happening? We are. All right, tell Odell to drive here already. The evacuation will start. Okay. Mark then turned to the police chief. Let's get going. It's better if we leave sooner. We need to get to Forenza before sunset. Isn't it too early? Forenza is just about half an hour from here on car right. Charmaine interjected. It was before the outbreak. Right now, even just going here from the city mall took us more than an hour when it should be just about ten minutes normally. Why? There are infected on the street and even cars blocking the roads. Maneuvering through those blockades and dealing with the infected would consume more time than traveling. There are even time we needed to drive back and forth since there are totally blocked and unusable roads. The chief nodded with Mark's explanation while the two women were also enlightened. With that, Mark carried the things he needed to bring while the nurse helped Charmaine walk out. Not wanted to be left out, Abigail volunteered to carry one of the bags. The bag looked too big for her but she carried it without effort. As the first people to be informed, Mark and his group was the first to move. Strange enough, Mark did not get out and just stood by the entrance of the building while holding his assault rifle. Due to this behavior of his, the rest of the group did not dare walk away from him and just waited by his side. The gunshots continued outside as the armed men kept the infected at bay under the chief's leadership. Mark was watching the situation while leaning on the frame of the door. The vehicles procured were several vans and multi-dot cabs. There was also a black car with a single 8 on the car plate. Cars with these plate numbers belonged to congressmen so this car should belong to Madame Laney. He was also sure that this was a bulletproof car. A minute later, the survivors started walking out of the building in a hurry. They all ran into the vehicles. It was not because they were panicking but it was instructed by the congresswoman. Everyone needed to hurry since the infected were gathering towards this direction. Soon, a large black modified van arrived. It was Mark's vehicle. The armed men let the vehicle come close to the entrance since Mark had a lot of things he was carrying. The vehicle stopped just beside the entrance of the command center. Then, under the gazes of the people around, the door opened and a very beautiful girl came out of the vehicle. Everyone who saw her froze on their steps and inhaled a mouthful of air amazed. Even the men shooting the infected could not help but stare. And then, under their surprised eyes, the beautiful girl ran towards Mark and embraced him tightly. Everyone choked. The contrast between the appearances of the two was like heaven and earth. If one were to use a Chinese idiom, it was like a flower stuck in a cow's dung. Disregarding the gazes she was gathering, May started examining Mark's body. On the other hand, Mark's face was very dark. Somehow, he was feeling irritated. He could not pinpoint why though since he could only detect the amazed and disappointed emotions of the people around him. Gidge, your wounds, is it fine? I'm fine. Look, it's already scabbed. Anyway, why did you go out? You're gathering attention you know that. But, Gidge. I'm worried. It was then, another woman's voice was heard. Master, just let her. She was too frantic when you got wounded that I had to snatch the radio away from her. Everyone looked at where the voice came from and saw someone coming out from the driver's seat of the vehicle. 
It was a beautiful woman. Even though she was not as beautiful as the first girl, her mature appeal hit the eyes of the older and younger men alike. But still, they froze when they realized what this woman called Mark. It echoed into their ears and they were screaming inside. You too. Mark sighed. He then heard a murmur behind him. No wonder my appeal did not work on him. He decided to ignore that. However, May did not. She started glaring at the nurse like a cat whose tail was stepped on. Mark started pushing May away and looked at Odlina. Odell, help me load these on the vehicle. He pointed at the things he put beside the entrance. Yes, master. Odlina then patiently loaded the things at the back of the vehicle. Charmaine then asked while looking at May. Dot, big brother. Your girlfriend. She's not. But. Okay. Charmaine wanted to continue asking questions but could she not notice Mark's bad mood while looking at the people staring at the beautiful girl hugging him. Soon enough, the survivors boarded the vehicles. The only people left outside were Mark's group and Madame Laney's group. Is everyone ready? Madame Laney asked Chief Mallory. We actually have three people missing. Ha. Huh. Who? Garcia and his men. What? Are they not coming? Madam, I think they wanted to come but. The police chief pointed at the entrance where Mark was. Mark was wiping blood from his nose when he noticed that the two people were looking at him, he called out. You guys ready to leave yet? Madam Laney realized what Mark was doing. She shook her head. We are ready. All right. Lead the way. We'll guard the back when we leave since there are still the infected coming from behind the city hall. Unexpectedly, an arm-sized tree root came busting out of the ground near Mark. The other people except Mark were surprised. Then, the root slowly came in front of him. He raised his head and looked at the huge tree and then back to the root in front of him. He reached to it and shook it. Since the huge tree wanted to befriend him, Mark did not deny its intentions. To his eyes, it was better to befriend something like this sentient tree than actually befriending the unstable humans. After he shook the root with his hand, several more roots busted out from the ground in the middle of the street. The roots then started to block the incoming infected. There's the queue, we're leaving. Mark shouted. They all boarded the vehicles and started to drive away. Strange enough, Mark sat beside the passenger door of his vehicle and the door remained opened. He then started to aim his M16 assault rifle at the entrance of the command center. Odell, stop the vehicle for a bit. Mark said and without questioning why, Odlina obeyed. The vehicle stopped by the corner street beside the city hall. Then three people came stumbling out of the entrance in a hurry. Their faces were covered with sweat and their expressions were filled with fear and panic. It was the businessman, Garcia, and his bodyguards. Wait. Wait for us. The three shouted in unison. It was then that the roots blocking the infected receded and the infected started running towards the three men who were shouting. Tist. 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 Several silenced gunshots could be faintly heard. Then, the three men shouting fell down and started screaming in pain. Their legs were shot and were bleeding profusely. Tist. 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 With their screams, the infected became more agitated. The bodyguards disregarded the pain on their legs and started to shoot the incoming infected. However, they were surprised. The infected running after them started falling down on the road before them. There were bloody holes all over their bodies. They started to feel hope. They thought that someone was trying to help them. What they did not notice was that none of the shots were aimed at the head of the running infected. After several seconds, the infected that had fallen started to stand up once more. Then. Garcia and his men could only let out their painful screams as they were voraciously eaten by the biters that had turned into eaters.